Okay, I think we're ready to start now. Absolutely. Um, please check the chat for any um, guidelines or housekeeping, but also we will be recording this session, um, the opening remarks as well. So if you would prefer not to be um, on camera, you're welcome to turn your video off. And yeah, we're ready to go. So uh, hello, Adab, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are the Tasawwur Collective, and we are very pleased to welcome you to our first annual symposium with the theme, Writing Muslim Women in South Asia. Um, so just to introduce ourselves for those of you who don't know, Tasawwur Collective is a consortium of early career postgraduate researchers, and it comprises of Fatima, you're on mute. Sorry, I think it, we were automatically all being muted. Um, where was I? Okay, so we are a consortium of uh, early career postgraduate researchers, and we comprise of Zara Kazmi from the University of St. Andrews, wave Zara. Um, Sheila Lati Sahana from the University of Edinburgh, wave. And myself, Fatima Naveed from the University of Exeter. We are three English literature PhD students, um, and we work on Muslim South Asia in various capacities. And we came up with the idea for this collective and by extension, this symposium, um, because we really wanted to help connect a very large but very disparate number of scholars who work on this topic um, across many different fields, academically including humanities and social sciences. Um, and we have been very, very generously supported by a very active community of academics, students, writers, journalists, artists, you name it. Um, and they have really, really contributed immensely to making our symposium a reality from putting up with endless emails to just all sorts. So we would really like to thank them for being here and for joining us. Our exciting panels for the three days of the symposium comprise a mix of established scholars and early career researchers. We would have loved to do this in person, but we decided to keep the symposium online for accessibility related reasons, particularly for academics from the global south. Muslim women in South Asia have often been misrepresented, unheard and actively othered. There is a long and often neglected history of Muslim women intervening in debates about reform, decolonization, and citizenship to assert their own interests and identities, pioneering the rise of feminist scholarship and activism in South Asia. From Begum Rokeya Sakhawat Hussain to Kamila Shamsi, one can trace a long history of Muslim women writers and thinkers who have fundamentally altered contemporary literary and political discourse. A careful examination of these narratives surrounding Muslim women's intellectual and political existence validates the significant work of important recent scholars, many of whom we are privileged to have amongst our midst as our featured and keynote speakers. Navigating binaries of emancipation and oppression, Muslim women have carved their own identities to interrogate and subvert these categorizations. This symposium is an attempt to bring together scholars, thinkers, artists, and activists to create such a discursive space for a timely conversation on Muslim women's pasts and presents. Uh, thanks so much for that, Sheila. But so uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules before we start off with our panels. Uh, you are requested to keep your mic switched off unless you're speaking. Please note that the timings mentioned in our schedule are in British summer time. So do calculate times according to your own time zone. Uh, for those of you who don't know, BST is GMT plus one. Uh, so just calculate according to that. Uh, please join your panels five minutes in advance and make sure that you have shared, in case you're a speaker, any audiovisual material with your chair before the panel starts. Um, in terms of whether you want to operate the PowerPoint or you would like us to operate the PowerPoint for you, just let us know. Uh, please note that the timings mentioned in our, uh, sorry, Sorry, our invited speakers are keynotes and featured speakers as indicated in our schedule. Featured speakers can have anything between 20 to 30 minutes for their presentation. We have set aside an hour each for our keynote speakers. Uh, that is Professor Tahira Nakhli, Professor Atharzia, Professor Sylvia Vatuk, and Professor Shanila Khoja Mulji. And that one hour is meant to include both their talks and the Q&A. All other speakers must make sure that their presentations are no more than 15 minutes. 
there will be a joint q and a at the end of each panel which will uh, 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 sorry which will not be recorded uh, we have participants joining us from many different corners of the world so we would request all speakers to stick to their allotted time limits to ensure that we conclude each panel on time if your presentations have any possible sensitive images or topics we would urge you to start off with a content warning the content warnings are also mentioned in the book of abstracts for attendees in case they would like to peruse through that if you are on twitter please retweet us and share your thoughts about the symposium with the hashtag #tasavvur2022 and tag us at tasavvur collect please note we have parallel panels so there are different links for each please click on the respective links in the email sent to you from eventbrite to join the panel that pertains to your interests all the proceedings as i mentioned earlier of this symposium will be recorded unless you have already told us that you would prefer not to be and shared on youtube in the coming days so you can catch up on any panels that you are unable to join live if you are an attendee and would not like to be recorded please keep your videos off um again q and a's will not be recorded um Without much further ado, let's get started with the Sawar 2022 Writing Muslim Women in South Asia. If you want to attend Panel One A, please stay on on this link. And if you want to join One B, click on the second link sent to your inbox. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you all in the upcoming panels. Just to clarify, panels um, start on the hour, so it's about ten thir thirteen minutes odd left. Um, so you're oh. welcome to come and go, and we will start um, the panels A one A here and one B at the other link on the hour, whichever time zone you're in. Perfect. <clears throat> Uh, thank you so much for joining us and for taking out the time. Uh, panel 1A is titled uh, Intersections of Identity Formation. And we are so pleased to have this wonderful uh, lineup of speakers okay. join us. Um, it's uh, it's really indeed quite a, quite a, quite a privilege to have you here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what's going on uh, with that, but anyway. Um, Suti, maybe if we can uh, mute this person. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying, but I cannot seem to find the mute option. I'm just uh, going to look into it. Sorry, please continue. I think they're quiet. No, no, that's fine. That's okay. Um, tech issues um, but yes so through this panel and the and the speakers that we've brought together today uh, we hope to engage with the question of uh, what it is that goes ahead and forms the popular pop, the image of the muslim woman in the popular conscious and we have a fascinating we we have some fascinating abstracts uh, about this that we've received um so uh before i go ahead i just want to uh, let you all know that uh, uh professor rizvi and professor jackson have anything between 20 to 30 minutes each to uh for their presentations uh but uh amal and mubin you have uh, uh 15 minutes each um so just just to clarify that and I re re request all of you to uh, stick to your time time limits to make sure that we uh, that you know we finish on time. Um, uh, another thing uh, that I wanted to sort of highlight 
was uh, that the q a option is available to all the attendees uh the which you can make use of and post your questions on the chat uh which will be received by uh tech support uh uh so yeah please go ahead and and make use of that you can do this while uh, the speakers are presenting but we also will have a separate q a uh, at the end um so yes without further ado i will just introduce the line of speakers that we have today with us um we have with we're very pleased uh, and privileged to have professor fatima rizvi join us today she is a professor in the department of english and modern european languages at the university of lucknow she has uh, published a translation of kurutelen haider sitaro se aage beyond the stars and other stories with women unlimited recently um Currently, Professor Rizvi is co-editing Deglobalizing Disability, a collection of academic essays on disability, and translating stories and essays for an anthology, Summer Medley, Aparatul and Haider Misseleni. Professor Rizvi has done years of very valuable work in this field, and we are, we are very, very indeed lucky to have her joining us today. So thanks so much. Um, I'll, Thank you. I'll introduce just everyone in one go and then we can sort of start off. Uh, uh, our second speaker for the day is uh, a friend and, uh, and a wonderful academic, uh, uh, Dr. Mubin Hussain, who I remember sort of seeing around in the Cambridge South Asian Studies Library when I was a very confused master student and she seemed to somewhat know much more than what much more than me about what she was doing um and now uh, is and uh, is uh, working as a postdoctoral research fellow at trinity college dublin's colonial legacies project uh Mubin is an early career historian of the british empire with an expertise on race caste gender medicine and corporeal consumption in south asia she is also working on her first monograph based on her doctoral thesis completed at cambridge in 2021 on race colorism and skin lightening in colonial India. Thanks so much for joining us, Mubin. Um, I'd also like to introduce our third speaker for the day, uh, Amal Akhtar, who is a PhD student at the Department of History in the University of Washington, Seattle, and is working on Urdu print and literary culture uh, and the multiple social identities and belongings of a fragmented Urdu reading public in 20th century North India. Uh, Akhtar's writing has appeared in The Hindu, The Indian Express, The Wire, and The Quint. She is also an editor and translator uh, with contributions in Seher ul Manazil uh, and uh, with Tulika Books in 2017, and Asar ur Sanadid with Tulika Books again in 2018. I hope I have not messed up the pronunciation of that. Um, and lastly, we are really uh, privileged again to have Dr. Elizabeth Jackson join us, uh, who is a senior lecturer, lecturer in literatures in English at the University of West Indies in Trinidad. Uh, she has a PhD from Goldsmiths College uh, at the University of London, and her research interests include South Asian and South Asian diasporic literatures, gender and cultural identity. Her single author publications Feminism and Contemporary Indian Women's Writing with Palgrave Macmillan, Muslim Women Writing in English with Peter Lang, and Global Childhoods and Cosmopolitan Identities uh, in Literature, which is with Brill and forthcoming, um, have uh, uh, have gone ahead and made a big difference in, in how we understand uh, South Asian literature and Muslim women's writing in particular. Uh, so yes, we're really, really pleased to have all four of you join us. So thank you so much. Um, uh, I mean, if, if, Doc, Professor Rizvi, we can start with you whenever you're ready. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm ready yeah. to go. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. So hi, everyone. Uh, before I begin my presentation, I'd like to thank everyone at the Silver Collective for inviting me as a featured speaker and more importantly, for featuring uh, Muslim women from South Asia. Uh, my paper is rather elaborate in theme and in subject. And, uh, you know, this may actually prevent me from uh, articulating all my references or giving every detail of the background. Uh, but I'll be happy to take questions at the end of the session. And uh, I'll share my screens because I have a PowerPoint to, uh, to, to uh, begin with. So I'll begin sharing now. Yeah. 
So uh, the title of my paper is uh, Challenging the Medians, Three Path-Breaking Muslim Women Writer Activists. Owing to shifts in colonial policies after the 1857 uprising, the Muslim community found itself faced with various challenges, all pointing towards the urgency to adapt and acclimatize in order to prevent itself from lagging behind the Hindu community, which was already making rapid progress. Sayyid Ahmed Khan made groundbreaking efforts to unfetter the community of outdated practices, halt its decline and modernize it, but repudiated, repudiated the idea of formal education for girls. The community could not modernize by excluding one half of its population from education. It had to modernize as a whole. Moreover, parda and polygamy, offshoots of patriarchal systems, also obstructed advancement and threatened to cast doubt over fundamental religious principles. The earliest to counter these was the institution of schools for girls. However, it would be a while before a significant number of schools enrolled a large number of girl students. A substantial corpus of reformist and didactic fiction in indigenous languages, mostly by men, exhorted women to become better wives and daughters by promoting rationale, thrift, and learning according to a combination of Victorian and Islamic principles. Nationalist debates regarding recasting women in roles, fomenting a national, nationalist culture centered on the view that given the necessary educational and social professional impetus, women could participate in processes of nation building. These debates also played out essentially in male dominions. Sufficient numbers of women may or may not have been represented or they may not have represented themselves in these ideas of nationalist refashioning. Around the same time, Muslim women's journalism began to thrive. Magazines and periodicals became popular discursive platforms from which women articulated, debated, and even educated the readers. As women writing women, they brought new perspectives to the literature they published and actively championed causes supporting reform, education, and modernization. These journals may, may be understood as some of the earliest denunciations made by upper middle class educated women. They indicate that women perceive the need for self-determination and reform among themselves. All inclusive development is essential for meaningful progress. Moreover, no change is no process of change is seamless, nor can progress happen without meeting with resistance, without rupture or fracture. Despite blockades, once processes of Muslim women's modernization were underway, they inspired more and more women to lead from the front. This paper implements a transnational approach to read efforts exerted by three path-breaking individualistic Muslim writer activists in 20th century British India, who challenged the medians and led by example. The three writers it reads as active agents of change are Rafaya Sakhavat Hussain, Iqbal Unissa Hussain, and Rashid Jahan. The paper focuses on relevant facts of their lives, reads ways and means in which they challenge parda and polygamy and promoted education as a pertinent means to counter backwardness. It reasons that their campaigns ensure that they are among the earliest feminist Muslim women in colonial India. This brings me to a brief biography of my three writers. Rukhaya Sakhavat Hussain was born in colonial Bengal. According to prevalent trends, unlike her brothers, she was denied school ed education and even home tuition by a missionary woman for fear that she would corrupt her parda. A quick learner, she picked up Bengali, Urdu, and English in the seclusion of the night, studying with her elder siblings to dawn while they did their learning after their father had gone to bed. An elder brother and a much older widowed sister mentored her to self-educate, rationalize, and develop her individuality. She was married at 16 to the Urdu-speaking, educated and westernized, but far older Sayyid Sakhavat Hussain, deputy marriage posted in Bhagalpur at the time of the marriage. He supported her inclination to study, encouraged her to write, and urged her to socialize with non-Muslim women in the neighborhood. Iqbal Unissa Hussain was born in Bangor in a distinguished family. She studied at home and was married to Sayyid Ahmed Hussain at 15. Iqbal Unissa observed Parda. Hussain was modern and encouraged her to educate herself. She completed her secondary and higher secondary education and graduation, bearing seven children during the time. She gave up Parda in 1931. In 1933, she traveled to the University of Leeds for a master's program in education with her eldest son. The photograph on the slide shows uh, an illustration of her at least. Uh, in doing so, she joined the small, a small group of Muslim women, Amina Tayyabji, Kweda Fateh Ali, and Atiyah Faizi, who traveled to England to study. People's responses were mixed. While some celebrated her decision, others judged her harshly. Dogmatic religious leaders and critics condemned her and her family, 
threatening sabotage, annihilation, and exclusion from burial places. The family survived these threats. Rashid Jahan was the eldest daughter of Sheikh Abdullah and Begum Bahid Jahan, both instrumental in establishing and running the Muslim Girls' School in Aligarh. As a student at her parents' school, she displayed immense interest in India's history and political struggles. She grew up caring indiscriminately for the underprivileged and gave up Arda as a young girl. In 1929, she completed her medical training from the Lady Harding Medical College in Delhi with a specialization in gynecology and took up a post at Dufferin Hospital in Lucknow. Jahan found herself belonging to a lean body of women contending to bridge the gap between Western medicine and the Indian populace, generally suspicious of it. Soon after, she became the only woman contributor to Angare, the slim collection largely believed to have catalyzed the radicalization of Urdu literature. In 1933, she joined the Communist Party of India and became a prominent member and avid worker from the United Provinces. She married Mahmoud Zafar in 1934. In 1936, she became a founder member of the All India Progressive Writers Association with Sajjad Zaheer, Ahmed Ali, and Mahmoud Zafar. This brings me to the next part of my paper, where we deal with the, how these women counteracted or challenged Parda and polygamy. Most upper and middle class Muslim women were restricted by the strict observance of Parda, which was symbolic of social status and religious identity. Young girls remained confined within zananas, experiencing denials of the most basic kinds. Parda stagnated them, inhibited healthy, all-inclusive development, and encouraged them to become perpetuators of unequal systems of existence. Despite repetitive writings and welfare organizations, polygamous practices and early marriages continued to be the mediums. In addition, the rigors of repeated childbearing made women lead dissipated lives. Asi Alam notes that polygamy was not only about marital relationships, it also affected child rearing, child rearing relationships in extended families, and uh, inheritance of property. She goes on to add that colonial missionaries often identified polygamy specifically as a feature of Islamic society because the Quran sanctioned it. The Parda system and the sanction for multiple marriages in Islam mattered also to the modernizing precepts underway in colonial India and was debated by religious leaders and reformists. In 1905, Rukhaya Sakhavat Hussain published Sultana's Dream. Hussain challenges patriarchal practices and ideals by diametrically reversing male and female roles. The story unfolds like a dream vision or a waking dream of the narrator Sultana, who accompanies a woman she perceives as her friend, Sister Sara, on an excursion to the garden. Ruled by a lady queen, Lady Land, the place Sultana finds herself in is Rukhaya's imagined utopian space where ethics, customs, practices, and patterns of human existence are reversed in favor of women. Perhaps the most ingenious inversion Hussein makes is that of the Mardana or outer men's spaces and the Zanana or inner women's quarters. While men are confined in inner Mardana, women confidently roam outer Zanana. The story develops on the dual premises that men have low moral standards, are impatient, wild, power hungry, full of brawn, lacking intellect, good for nothing dawdlers, poor at governance, and so best shut in wars. And women, on the contrary, are morally upright, intelligent, rational, intellectually far better govern, qualified to govern, kind hearted, principled, and far more capable of accomplishing their ends by comparison with men, and hence better suited for act outdoor activities and governance. Parda features on two occasions in the story. Firstly, when Sultana feels awkward as a Parda Nasheen and she walks unveiled in the streets of Lady Land. In the second instance, it, it features as a liberating experience when women of Lady Land plead confinement of men in honor of Parda so that they may go to battle with the enemy, against the enemy. Denial of education and, uh, uh, for women, an issue that no, uh, no doubt irked Hussein, also features in Sultana's dream, making it a science fiction. The wise and sagacious Lady Queen of Lady Land is a votary of women's education and encourages scientific and technical advancement. Lady Land thrives on farming methods sustained by electricity, harnessing rainwater and solar energy, air travel machines void by electricity, harnessing rainwater and solar energy, air travel machines uh, void by electricity and hydrogen power, and artificial methods of temperature control. Hussein emphasizes that women's intellectual capacities are as or perhaps more sound than men's. She also proffers a self-critique to Sultana's companion, who gently admonishes her with the charge that women in her land have been neglectful of their natural right by turning a blind eye to their own interests. Sakhabat Hussain called the ingenious, witty, and humorous Sultana's dream a terrible revenge. He was instrumental in its publication. 
Ruqayya Sakabat Hussain believed it was imperative to release Muslim women from practices that confined them. By 1904, she was contributing regularly to Bengali Muslim women's magazines with a view to exposing patriarchal systems and Muslim women's subordination. She employed scathing satire, tremendous anger, and biting with wit without camouflage. Avarod Basani, uh, in 1929, it, it was published in 1929 as a collection. Prior to that, it was being published, serialized in the journal Muhammadi, is a collection of candid real life vignettes for grounding ridiculous, absurd, horrible, and tragic aspects of Farda or extreme seclusion imposed on Muslim women. Hussein draws on personal experiences to narrate about the paradoxes within the system, provides strict female perspectives to depict various instances of strict Farda observance and expresses her own observations in contradiction of it. Also included in the text are instances of women's resistance to Farda and seclusion. Hussein's tone is by turns angry, combative, sad, horror-struck, ironical, satirical, and even humorous. Hussein was condemned and ridiculed for being the insider who exposed the goings on within the system or for siding with everything Euro-American <clears throat> as opposed to everything Indian. <clears throat> as regards the Parda system in Islam, Iqbal Nisa reasoned that it was meant to elevate and provide greater respect to women rather than subjugate or confine them. She also emphasizes, quoting from the Quran, that polygamy is not favored in Islam and urges that the text be understood and interpreted correctly instead of being misused in the interest of male depravity. Hussein believes that Parda constricts Muslim women and perceives education as the only means to, means to countering the ill effects of the system. The freedom to maintain four wives at a time without consideration to the injunctions and obligations regarding equality and treatment is under contestation in her only novel, feminist novel, uh, Parda and Polygamy, Life in an Indian Muslim Household. Also under contestation in the novel is a disorderly, unhealthy and confining Zanana with its doggedness on Parda and contingent precepts. Hussein's novel is anti-romantic and sociologically realistic. It is a stultifying account of a people who uphold polygyny and objectify women, where women are perpet perpetrators, perpetuators and equal participants with men in encouraging patriarchy and patriarchal systems. The reader is catapulted into prison like Vilkusha, where maintaining multiple wives becomes a matter of course. Zura is in a man monogamous but subjugating marriage with Umar. Tyrannized when she is widowed, she overcomes, assuming the role of matriarch, controlling her household and her only son Kabir. She marries him first to good-looking, wealthy but meek Nazli, who turns out to be constitutionally weak as well. Then on the basis of frivolous pretext, she arranges another marriage with healthy, poverty-stricken, but as it turns out, plain-looking Munira. Thereafter, Kabir marries surreptitiously. Makbul is good-looking, literate, accomplished, and economically secure. Zura, Zura tyrannizes all three women. Finally, Kabir marries the poor but pretty Nujaha, convinced that he is performing a sacred duty towards her impoverished family and herself. Hussein concludes the novel on the proposition that after Kabir and Zohra's deaths, Nazni is free to wield power like the mother-in-law, controlling her son Akram and her covid -os. Fallacies and power dynamics repeat themselves, generation after generation. This is a singularly disconcerting closure, considering that Dilkusha is supposed, supposedly a prototypical Muslim household. I'm referring to the subtitle of the text when I say this. Hussein comments on the events as an ex educated outsider. She is at times scathingly ironic, at times didactic, at times philosophical and even fatalistic. She explores both conspiracy and sisterhood in a narrative that remains an admixture of hope and hopelessness, authority and vulnerability, simplicity, duplicity, and connivance. Rashid Jaha's debut contributions to Angare exposed the hypocrisies of Farda and polygamy. They shocked and alarmed readers, became hallmarks of feminism in Urdu literature, upset society mediums, exposed the contradictions on which Muslim society was founded, and earned her the moniker. Angarevali. For the first time, a woman writer had consciously treated of female domains, particularly the female body, as an entity subjugated by male ascendancy. Jahan was threatened with dire consequences, including having acid thrown on her face or her nose chopped off. Dilli Ki Sair is a short story where young Malka narrates her travel experiences of her first trip to Delhi, sponsored by her husband, who wishes to take her out on an excursion. Ironically, Malka's visit to Delhi does not extend beyond the railway station, where seated alone by her baggage, she awaits her husband's return, 
who has sauntered off with some wretched station master acquaintance. He returns, having eaten at a hotel, twirling his moustache and offering to get her pudis if she is hungry. The story captures her feminine uncertainties, fears and misgivings, simultaneously recording her disgust of both her damned Purka and these cursed men. Resolutely, she returns to Faridabad by the next train. Jahan further emphasizes the man's callousness by indicating that he neither perceives his point of view, his wife's point of view, nor comprehends her anxiety, nor her will to return to Faridabad, and believes her to be a spoiler over and above. Parde Ke Piche dramatizes a conversation between Mohammadi Begum and her sister-in-law, Aftab Begum, in the privacy of the Zanana. The women discuss Mohammadi's pregnancies, modern methods of their birth control, miscarriages, venereal disease, the insatiable sexual appetite of men, their infidelities and polygamy. With the veil at metaphor, Rashid Jahan unveils a series of domestic situations that provide an espial of the protagonist's suffering and objectification in her own home. Woefully, she now launches into a narrative of his callousness, infidelity and threats to divorce, while the children run in and out of the disorderly room. Mohammadi Begum's encounter with the lady doctor uh, further serves to lift the veil higher and reveal the mystique and silence that enshrouds the female body. As Miss Sahiba probes her patient's ailing body, she is shocked at her medical condition and baffled by the young Mohammadi's pale and wizened appearance. Aftab and Mohammadi's sharing their problems and dilemmas, which stem from a common source, reveals their sisterhood. Jahan's play, dialogic rather than performative, can be understood as contesting outdated stereotypes regarding women and also projecting conversations that go on in Zanana spaces, challenging patriarchal expectations and calling for fundamental change. By bringing into perspective the benefits of professional qualification and economic independence, she attempts to knock barriers that segregate men's and women's worlds. Jahan's attempts to Jahan attempts to provide solutions based on modern science and education. This brings me to the next section of my uh, essay, Towards Education and Emancipation. By the last quarter of the 19th century, as progressive Muslim intelligentsia began to feel the need for women's emancipation, educating them began to be perceived as a compelling necessity. As reading and writing emerged as the most significant means to educate girls, schools providing basic and medium level education began to be founded. Curricular deferred. Educating religious ideals was a must and strict parda was observed. These schools, uh, Badruddin Tayyabji school was one exception where parda and religious education were not a must. Uh, these schools can be understood as the earliest concerted ingenious efforts to modernize women. However, misgivings and fallacies reign, enrollments remained low, and educated Muslim women teachers were a rarity. Most often patriarchal heads or father figures insisted on home education for their daughters. If they conceded to send their women and daughters to school, the content co-mingled with desires for erudite wives and companions, rather than the altruism to engender individualism and independence. Rukhaya Sakhavat Hussain instituted the Sakhavat Memorial Girls School for women's education. Her path was rough. She began humbly with a handful of students, but gained strength in a short span of time. She and her fellow educated and staff continually found themselves under scrutiny of detractors and had to prove every now and again their moral and ethical credentials. Consequently, she observed Parda continually giving logical arguments against it. She reasoned that Parda was ethical, not natural, and insisted that it was meant for a put as a protection, not as a confinement. She believed that girls' education and self-realization were possible in spite of Parda. Two major hurdles, and which I've already talked about, uh, Hussein encountered were procuring qualified teachers for the increasing number of students and the means of transport for them. Both often obstacles encountered by early women educators. In 1916, Hussein instituted the Bengal branch of the Anjumanya Khabatin Islam, the All India Muslim Ladies Association of Bengal which worked relentlessly for underprivileged women's education and emancipation, irrespective of religion, class or, class or caste, mostly in the slums of Calcutta. The women worked in teams, offering financial, medical and educational support, rescuing and sheltering physically and emotionally violated women and educating in childcare and personal hygiene. They were often shooed away, but Hussein understood the benefits of solidarity and perseverance and continued on the path to educate, emancipate and liberate women till her last. 
Iqbal Unnisa's uh, education at Leeds enabled her engagement with various international fora. In 1934, at the Conference of the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts in Switzerland, she presented a report on, of guiding in India, detailing the work done by the Bluebirds in training girl guides. Writing about the educative value of girl guides, Hussein finds that the training helps physical, psychological, emotional, and intellectual growth, enables girls to become more reasonable members of a rapidly advising, uh, advancing society, makes them more helpful, and enables them to, enact, to act with greater responsibility for the benefits of the larger populace. She also reasons that girl guiding helps make them better homemakers and mothers, improves their sense of hygiene and nursing skills, along with generating a strong sense of vocation. vocation. At Tease, Hussein also got her earliest opportunities to engage with the Muslim diaspora and the Muslim community abroad. She delivered her first lecture to a gathering of men on the importance of women's education at the Muslim Society of Great Britain. Hussein stressed that men and women were fundamentally equal, endowed with the same power of feelings, sentiments, and emotions, the same faculties of mind. She also delivered a talk about the relevance of women's rights and women's responsibilities and their duties as mothers in fomenting a pop political culture of equality at the uh, 12th conference of the International Alliance of Women's for Suffrage and Equal Citizenship in Istanbul the same year, that is 1935. Back in India, she wrote relentlessly on subjects such as women's status in society and Islam, inadequate ed educational opportunities, the Parda system, polygamy, a host of superstitions and anomalies regarding their very existence, and the often unequal and inhuman treated out to them by their men folk. Hussein's approach is comprehensive and constructive. Her essay, The Position of Women in India, urges the obligation to educate women and enable them to become brave, thoughtful, and active participants in the education and social and political activities of their country, for India cannot for long deny half her effective population the weapon that she needs for her own national regeneration, education. In the effect of early marriage on Indians, Hussein focuses on ethical, social, and cultural issues that compel early marriages. She explains that physical, psychological, and intellectual health issues can become serious hazards for young couples, especially women and their offspring. She advises that education, particularly higher or university education and vocational training, are significant means of endowing powers of self-reliance, discernment, and erudition. Hussein believes that it is important for a girl to be educated or trained in some vocation rather than be married. A votary of modernism, she condemned outdated customs sponsored in part by Qasi Islamic precepts promulgated by the clerics. She deplored that these were internalized mechanically by an unthinking people lacking edu education and erudite con contemplation and contended that they constrained Muslim society. Hussein elucidates by means of women's rights of inheritance and the choice of freedom in selecting their life partners that Islam confers equal rights on men and women. She reasons on the basis of the Quran that patriarchy, not Islam, subjugates women. She believes that the backwardness of Muslim women is contingent upon irrelevant Victorian ideals and often tyrannical patriarchal values. Inadequate educational opportunities, scant nutritional attention, and deficient psychological understanding. She holds parents who are often oblivious of the relevance of these in ensuring healthy all-round growth of their offspring, responsible for deficient daughters who, who, who are characterized with dissipated energy levels. In Is the Present Dowry System Justified? Hussein takes a holistic view of the evils plaguing Indian society. Here she talks about both Hindu and Muslim families, uh, tracing the prevalence of the dowry system to lack of education. She also blames the large sections of educated but unemployable young men and their families for demanding dowries, questioning their sense of rectitude and their ideals. Parents, she advises, should educate their daughters and strive to make them efficient first, for early marriages are at the root of many evils. Besides, they steal girlhood in most cases, making the girl child leap to womanhood in a single act. We talk about Rashid Jahan now. Gifted with deep compassion for the weak and the ailing, influenced strongly by communist ideology, devoted wholeheartedly to her profession and characterized by a rebellious spirit, Rashid Jaha believed that healing had a lot to do with connecting with people on personal and psychological levels. 
her political engagements, her medical training, and her zeal to educate her countrywomen regarding their biological selves, their sexual rights, and available medical possibilities informed her attitude while she worked in remote districts as a provincial servant. Rashid Jaha wrote with the precision and composure of a medical doctor and uncovered hitherto veiled regions of female habitation. Her profession gave her an advantage uh, over women who she treated and provided access to private spheres of habitation of the female body and female consciousness. She emphasized the female biological, raising a pertinent voice against the colonization of the female body and spaces of female habitation. Her works attempt at initiating gendered insubordination. Jahan was the first Urdu woman to write, first Urdu woman uh, writer to articulate dissatisfaction and disappointments within private spaces hitherto concealed from the public domain. Her oeuvre is meant essentially to reach out to female readers and give them the confidence to articulate themselves while also educating male readers with regard to female issues. Candid, honest, and literarily unadorned, her writings actually shocked and shook fatuous readers out of their complacency. She is widely known to have pioneered Marxist feminist tendencies in Urdu drama and the Urdu short story. Her plays and stories also juxtapose men and women from privileged and marginalized backgrounds in accordance with Marxist communist values. Subjugation and privilege, wealth and poverty, poverty, education and ignorance are only a few of the binaries within which she casts her characters. Rashid Jaha wrote to promote the benefits of Western medicine and secular modern values. She emphasized modernity and progress and stressed a relook into ethical and cultural perspectives regarding women. As a founder member of the All India Progressive Writers Movement, Rashid Jaha traveled and campaigned to pledge support for it. Writing about gender, medicine, and the politics of space, she became an icon of literary radicalism, decried by some and celebrated by others. In progressive families, she became a symbol of an emancipated woman. In conservative homes, the example of all the worst that can occur if a woman is educated, not kept in parda, and allowed to pursue a career. This brings me to the conclusion of my paper. Uh, women's position in Indian society became a major zone of contestation owing to conflicts vis-a-vis -vis values and ethics regarding education, further and polygamy, and emerging nationalist sensibility, sensibility and new roles expected of them. While well-meaning reformers and reforming institutions took up their causes with views to uplift or emancipate them, most of these efforts aimed to make them better wives, companions, mothers, daughters, or sisters. It was only when women began to articulate themselves and act, exert active efforts in their own better interests that independence and individualism began to be propagated at the earliest, and the earliest indicators of feminist sensibilities and articulations began to be noticed. Rukhaya Sakhavat Hussain, Iqbalun Nisa Hussain, and Rashid Jaha exerted meaningful efforts towards modernizing and educating women in different geographical and linguistic locations across India. These 20th century writer activists blazed the trail to come out of Parda to receive education and become conscious of their health and hygiene and overcome patriarchal subjugations. They preempted new feminist directions and produced a body of literature in Bengali, English, and Urdu that became the hallmark of contemporariness and progress. Their works encouraged younger writers and activists to continue the crusade in favor of women and women's rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rizvi. That was Thank that you. was fascinating. Thank you. We have, uh, I'm sure this will elicit a bunch of questions. I'm, uh, apologies in the beginning. We had a slightly chaotic beginning, so I forgot to add this. But uh, after Mubin, we will take a, a, a five-minute break and then start with uh, Amal and uh, then Professor Jackson, um, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Uh, um, uh, Mobin, uh, would you be happy to start now, uh, if that's good? Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, great, great, perfect. Can you see? Yeah, yeah, all good. Okay, thank you again for, for setting up such an amazing event. I'm really looking forward to the next couple of days. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, and also for setting up the panels as well. Um, I'll just start to, to, stick to stick to my strict 15 minutes. A woman entering from the drawing room, a stranger breaking into the respectability of their preserve. The folds of her sari were crushed by the coat she took off. The rain streamed from her hair, which she pushed from her eyes. Waved hair, real or artificial, 
Red nails. Toes. Must be painted too under those shoes. Sari. Red as the nails. A little wet at the edges and clinging to a slim figure. Soft, dark face. Shy smile. Eyebrows not plucked. Strangely enough, deep eyes, but cold as rain. This is an extract, uh, a scene from The Storm, a short story penned by Atia Hussein and published posthumously. It encapsulates some of the tension and navigations involved in the making of modern identities amongst elite and middle-class communities in the early to mid 20th century. Part of elite Lignawi society, Hussein explores the shifting dynamics of upper caste Northern Indian society in her work and dissects, uh, dissects, dissects sorry, class, caste and gendered hierarchies. The storm, dating to around the 1930s and 40s, is a critique of class pretense. The story takes place in an undisclosed city with mountains and hills, perhaps a hill station which were often frequented by moneyed Indians and colonial elites, and in an unspecified place. It could be any upper middle class Indian home, either Muslim or Hindu. The woman coming in from the storm is a metaphor for the storm of modernity, a modernity expressed through the new kinds of behaviours, uh, new kinds of behaviours and um, and consumption patterns. The unnamed woman interrupts a mixed gendered dinner party, breaking the tableau, tableau of a carefully constructed and, cu and curated respectability and upending established conventions as a female stranger appearing unannounced. She stirs up sexual tensions due to the attention she received from the serving, but silent male guests. Her waved hair, painted red nails, and clinging red sari are signs of glamorous modern adornment, intensely scrutinized by all in attendance. She's perceived, perceived as having an attractive slim figure, but her dark face and unplucked eyebrows reveal an unacceptable racial difference and incomplete feminine adornment, an aesthetic reading that renders her inadequate. My broader work explores the ways in which race, skin colour, class and gendered markers of femininity were mapped onto the material choices um, of women, both um, within both Muslim and Hindu middle class communities. Today, I will focus specifically on early 20th century constructions of modern middle class Muslim womanhood in memoir and fiction. Reading selected stories from Atiyah Hussain's Phoenix Fled, first published um, in 1953, and Distance Traveller, in which the storm can be found, alongside Shaista Suadi Ikumala's account behind the veil, ceremonies, customs, and colour, and her memoir from Parda to Parliament, I pass out the ways in which meanings of modern and middle class were inscribed onto the body and within the home. I've already said a little bit um, about um, Ati Hussain, so give, to give a brief bio um, of Ikumala. Ikumala was born in Calcutta, but like other Bengali Muslims, felt affinities with Northern Indian Muslim culture. She was active in Delhi circles because both her father and uh, husband were in government service. Whereas Atiyah Hussain decided to stay in England after partition, having moved there just before partition with her husband, Ikumala migrated to Pakistan and is most well known for being one of the first women in parliament. In the first half, I will briefly show how authors scripted the modern Muslim female body through shifting aesthetic self fashioning against the backdrop of social religious reforms and national, nationalist imaginings. And in the second half, I will explore how Hussein and Ikumala conceived of interactions within the modern home to demonstrate how Indian Muslim womanhood is constructed against the articulation of others, rendering, rendering class and caste boundaries visible. I also argue, however, that inhibiting or vying to inhibit a modern middle class positionality in this period, there are actually more similarities than acknowledged between representations of urban middle class Hindu and Muslim womanhood. Ideas about fashionable and modern adornment, from jewellery and cosmetics to sartorial choices, became highly fraught in the 20th century due to further reinscriptions and the growing presence of women in public life, that is outside the Zenena and underground, and I think. Professor Rizvi kind of did a brilliant job of showing the kind of historical process of that. So essentially, women's faces and bodies were selectively more visible. Writings by Indian women show that the sartorial markers of Purata, far from fitting into binary narratives of veiling and unveiling and traditional, traditional and primitive versus modern and prog progressive, were often about layered navigations of space, familial hierarchies, and changing public roles. 
The contemporary relevance of Brazil was increasingly de debated in women's organizations and vernacular periodical literature. Some avid supporters of female social reform, such as from Gali um, educationist Shikawa Shikawa, Rikea Shikawa Tussain, personally adhered to Brazil practices and wore the burqa, but contested its severity in Indian customs. As Sonia Amin has noted, the burqa has all, had also emerged as a reformist modern invention and hallmark of respectability when upper, mid upper class women started to appear, appear in public. At the same time, many autobiographies by Muslim women reveal how the, the initial disapproval of fathers um, that came with this intergenerational transition from Bertha into a wider society were often superseded by the wishes of husbands. Navigations of Stereo Bertha were often an affective, um, an affective process dependent on public space. In From Bertha to Parliament, Ikramullah describes her own experience of coming out of Bertha at an executive councillor's garden party as making a debut. She writes, I did not enjoy my first experience of, of being out of Bertha at all. I felt embarrassed at being looked at by hundreds of men decked up all in my best, and my enjoyment of the party was further spoiled by having to spend my entire evening trying to avoid being seen by my uncle, who is very strongly, uh, who very dis strongly dis disapproved coming out of Bertha. Ikramula conforms to spousal expectation by supporting her husband's, um, husband's role in these social spaces, but also worried about fulfilling other familial expectations. More significantly, she reveals how this new visibility felt. Her feelings of embarrassment at men staring at her all decked up speak to the anxieties that many women felt now that they were in the public eye in mixed social spaces, even if they enjoyed them. Atiyah Sen also interrogates how women, women adapted to the desires of young men who came to dictate some of the changes in women's lives as part of new patriarchal expectations in her fictional writing. Short stories in Phoenix Fled, um, in the Phoenix Fled, uh, Fled collection, reflect the affective social and familiar navigations of compartment by Indian women in 1930s and 1940s in Northern India. In her story, Time is Unredeemable, she tells the story of a young wife, Bano, who eagerly awaits the return of her husband, Ashad, from England. She attempts to become the modern wife he expects through the careful selection and purchase of clothes and cosmetics after gaining consent from her mother-in-law to do so. She selects a deep red Benares net sari, lipstick, powder, and an English coat. Upon Ashad's return, Banu adorns herself and waits for him in their room. He, give, he gives her handbag, a gold watch, and fake pearls before stating, I must go now, Banu, to my own room sympathetically explaining that he does not know her. The story ends with Ashad accidentally spoiling his coat, apologizing, but stating, I didn't want you to wear this old coat anyway. The story epitomizes women's efforts to fashion themselves as desirable modern housewives in the pursuit of compassionate marriages within older con um, conjugal frameworks. The first party also conveys the perspective of a wife transitioning to the demands of late colonial society. A wife, her religious and regional background remains unspecified, accompanies her husband to an unsegregated party for the first time. Her panic matches Ikramullah's real one in wishing to be left un unobserved. Her bright, red, uh, her bright rich clothes and heavy jewellery feel oppressive when she observes the simplicity of the, of the clothes of the partygoers. The wife is shocked by the drinking and smoking she sees, but reserves her strongest objections for the women. She observes one woman whose, quote, light sari slipped from her shoulder and the tight red silk blouse outlined each high breast, which she responds to by pulling her own sari closer around her. And she describes dancing women as, quote, discussing shameless pussies, bold and free with men, their clothes adorning nakedness, not hiding it, with their painted false mouths, that short hair. This hyperbolic description of the party teases out some of the new behaviours of sociability that women were expected to selectively conform to among service and professional classes, while also rejecting some um, other Western influence trends perceived to contravene ideas of female modesty and respectability. Both stories also depict the growth of the stylish but simplistic sari as a popular modern middle-class form of dress among Muslim women too. Ikramullah remembers that these trends were changing in the 1920s. The older women, older women in her family complained about young girls becoming men for not wanting bright colours and rich trimmings, instead going for pastel colours and new styles of trimming. Ikramala notes that 
This was a time when we were going through what, we, what was called the modernization of our dress and jewelry. The sari itself became a subject of debate among Indian Muslims, particularly when debate, debating ideal Gomi Muslim Labas or national Muslim dress and regional differences amongst Muslim communities across India. I can say a little bit more about this in the Q&A, but I had to be really tight with what I wanted to include. So having spent some time discussing sartorial self-fashioning, I want to quickly move now to think about homes as crucial containers for this kind of experimentation that I've been talking about in the making of modern middle class identities. In an analysis of um, Ur an Urdu social media, Marcus Tichel notes that there was characteristically a middle class way of connecting the increasingly alienated living spaces in modern, modernizing cities with the vast expanses of the media world. From the late 19th century, women and their household activities had become targets of reform from both colonial and local social reformers. Hussein's fictional work and Ikramullah's non-fictional writing depict how urban modern middle class womanhood was marked through depictions of domestic servants and attempts to create caste and class boundaries in what Swapna Banerjee has called a system of exclusions in the commodification of domestic service. Servants as uh, daily workers, as opposed to intergenerational living members of the family, became portrayed across mass print as disloyal and untrustworthy in the early 20th century. And there is an elite, uh, elitist tendency amongst both Muslim and Hindus to romanticize the bygone era of West where servants lived in the household they served as members of the family. In Behind the Veil, written for Western friends, Ikrimullah conveys a sense of pride that Indian women still revel in the old, quote, pageantries of the East. She reminds historical so-called facts on Eastern customs from an old housemaid who was a custodian of the family's traditions and another maid servant, Lal Bibi, who had seen much of Nawabi culture in its decaying years. Both are spoken of with a fond nostalgia with no recognition of their lives separate from familial service. Writing about the shift in living servants to domestic workers, she remarks on um, reliability and loyalty. She writes, all servants, formed an important part of our background. They were exceedingly well-mannered, efficient, reliable, and absolutely devoted to the members of the house, the house they served, making the interest of their masters their own and accepting whatever they did unquestioningly. There were no concerns with politics. They were not concerned with politics. Their devotion was to their immediate masters and to nothing else. This type of servant was becoming rare by the time I set up my house. This feudal approach to labor provides a glimpse into changing uh, changes in urban domestic lives where servants were often censured for conveying needs that did not prioritize the house household. In satirical and instructional literature, employers were encouraged to mediate relationships with servants to neutralize the numerous threats of, of exceeding caste and class boundaries that servants posed in the domestic space. These vulnerabilities are explored in Adil Hussain's short story, Street of the Moon, which focused on an upper class families, low class and class servants. Hussein explores the intertwined, intertwined nature of gendered and class oppression by explore, exploring the sexual exploitation poor women faced, whether Muslim or Hindu. The story centers around Hasina, a poor villager whose mother, Nasira, works in the home. Hasina joins the household causing quite a stir with her fine looks. Hussein explores the stereotype of associating poor lower caste women with uncontrollable desires in the way that the other servants, including her own mother, talk about Hasina. Hasina is forced to marry the aged cook, Kalu, to stop him frequenting the street of the moon, called for the bottle quarters of the provincial town, and to police Hasina's desires. The young bride and the cook's indolent son have a, an affair, and later another servant, Hasnu, shows interest in Hasina. The story ends with Hasina disappearing, and we later find out that she is working in the street of the moon. One scene in particular acutely depicts the tensions of class and caste that modern compartment and inhabitation represented. Before disappearing, Hasina is caught applying the Begum Sahib's, Begum Sahib's cosmetics by Kalu. Must you look like women of the bazaars as well as behave like one? She flared. Begum Sahib uses it. You dare call her that? You are not the Begum Sahib. Leave the rich alone. Tell me, where did you get it? I took it. I'll put it back. I meant no harm. I wanted to see what it looked like, and she cried in sudden fright. She could not tell him Hasnu had tortured her with his boastful stories of city women who adorned themselves in this manner, in this new manner. 
Yeah. Just interrupting to let you know that you have a minute. Um, just uh, that's fine. Yeah. I'm nearly finished. Here, Hussein illustrates how cosmetics were also objects of class contention within intimate domestic spaces. The paint, rouge, powder, and lipstick are coded objects used by and manifested in the identification of various consumers. That, so that would be it. The bizarre woman here reads sex work or prostitute. A begum read elite or middle class housewife. And city women, urban modern girls all of which were contested in this storm of modernity. Brock Harley, this transgression, as opposed to her affair, is the one that propels him never to touch her scene again, as she has forgotten her place in disrupting the bounds of respectability in class within a middle-class middle class household. So, to conclude, this paper has taken the body, the body and home spaces and as intimately interconnected sites in the performance and preservation of class and caste within navigations of the modern. The scene from Atiyah Hussain's The Storm that I started with illustrates the gendered contestations around modernity most vividly. The intruding stranger in her red sari matches the dress and adornment of other women at the party, suggesting that they occupy the same class. But this dark, un unknown inter interloper represents a threat to upper class sociability and modern femininity. Her presence lays, lays bare the tense discursivities of upper and middle class modern womanhood when faced with shifting patriarchal, con, con, uh, patriarchal and uh, conjugal expectations within um, Muslim patriarchy. And the telling and documenting of memoir material and fictional representations help us to establish the doing of the material culture that I've discussed in the construction of this new modern middle-class Muslim womanhood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. What a fascinating presentation. And there is, I think, so much for us to excavate. Um, I'm just mindful of uh, um, Amal and uh, Professor Jackson's presentation. So we are at 2.55 uh, and the panel ends at around 3.45. We hope to start with the next panel at 2 p.m. British time. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, depending on what you would be comfortable with, Amal, I'm happy to, you know, give you have a two three minute break and then start or we can start we can skip the break and just uh go ahead and start with you because uh you know we want to keep enough time for q a as well um i'm okay with uh, with starting that's so uh, all right perfect yeah. so th the maybe we can just then skip on the break and make sure that we have plenty of time for q a because there are so many interesting ideas that have been discussed already and we just have uh we still have half the panel left um so uh yeah uh amal whenever you're uh, ready uh we can go ahead yeah sure thank you i'll just share my screen uh perfect yeah Sorry, I'm just going to go and check my system preferences. Oh, no, that's, uh, yeah. If you need anything, like I also, I, I believe you sent me your PowerPoint as well, so. Oh yeah, I did. Let me just try on my end. Uh, I'm just looking at your PowerPoint and it's so beautiful. <laughs> I love okay, it. I'm going pictures. to I'm going to let you do this because I this is that's, technology that's totally failed on my end. If you yeah, can that's okay. um, no no that's yeah. really fine. Um I'm just going to share the screen. Just let me just say next slide or next whenever uh, you yeah, want me to yeah. Yeah. thank you so much Zara. No, that's totally fine. Yeah. This is why we, uh, this is why we want yeah. to copy so this is for these kind of things. Just uh, I'm glad, I'm glad I sent it to you like 15 minutes before. Um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, is that, is this working? Uh, are you able to see my screen or? I was uh, just a minute ago, not anymore. Yeah, that's, I'll just restart, sorry. Uh, is this good? Yes, yes, now yes. I can. 
um i'll just begin by saying thank you for this opportunity for me to present like really preliminary work on this platform and for actually putting such incredible scholars together and for including me in in here um i will preface this presentation quickly by saying that this is an ongoing paper um and uh, this is very very much in the making it wasn't a prior kind of paper i began writing this in response to the suburb collective very thought provoking themes and um from having heard professor rizvi and mobeen's uh, kind of very eloquent presentations i can say that there will be many echoes to what i have to say already um i've looked at a patchwork of sources um for this paper on negotiating uh, sharafat muslim women social reform and cinema in uh, the 20th century and um i am interested in looking at the involvement of muslim women in films as performers between the decades of 1930s and 50s uh, the sources i have looked at and which i will be elaborating on are urdu film subscription journals published in the 1930s i have also begun exploring uh, literary fiction like qurratul and heather short stories and hindi cinema narratives but the last two even though i've begun exploring them i will not get into in this presentation in the interest of time i'm working on expanding the source base and kind of formulating connections between the different archives i'm looking at um but the urdu film journals throw light on the social attitudes to cinema and performance and to female or not um, autonomy and selfhood that muslim women had to survive within to negotiate uh, and attempt to subvert in the 20th century i am particularly interested in in the mid 20th century juncture because this was a time when multiple discourses coincided to advocate on muslim women's autonomy and colluded to essentially draw boundaries around it i'll primarily focus on film journals uh, which allow us to see um of uh, muslim women's presence in film as performers whose bodies are on display and who are objects of male desire and how they transgress the public private um divide that was key to the dominant social discourses of the time that fixated on binaries of morality and obscenity which were of course deeply gendered um could you go to the next slide please so the journals are examined are available through the british library archive of endangered materials from south asia the british library online archive has a um, rich but separate collection of urdu literary journals and these film journals are a new addition to this overall urdu archive that they've hosted and among those available that i have looked at are film review film star and filmistan all of which began in the 1930s uh, from calcutta as illustrated monthlies Urdu film journals proliferate uh, in the 1930s because of certain landmark changes that are happening in film primarily the introduction of sound which created the talkies which were a brand new attraction that signaled a major shift in production quality and thus the immersive nature of films um advertising was more elaborate and extensive in film journals and the publications being but the sweet or with picture supplements uh, were a key feature that was highlighted prominently in the magazines Uh, next slide for example film review advertised itself as hindustan ka pehla batasvi risala pictured an illustrated journal with full pages of picture supplements punctuating the text that depicted studio photographs of actors most regularly those of women performers in various evocative and flirtatious and sensuous dance poses that we can see here the distinction in the archival classification of urdu film journals from uh, literary publications of the same time might seem unnecessary well it did to me initially but it is meaningful when we analyze the discourses therein scanning the textual and visual discourse in these urdu film journals during the 1930s reveals that the, the outlooks to cinema and muslim women's participation in it as performers were influenced by intersecting discourses spearheaded by men that permeated the urdu literary world at this time these were um as both professor isvi and mubeen have kind of mentioned uh, in their presentations articulations of community identity along religious lines and an accompanying social reform impulse that was centered on islam or a movement towards moral ethical conduct next slide let's take community identity for instance uh i think you need to click one more time thank you yeah. um by the mid 20th century the urdu literary sphere saw language community and nation being collectively imagined in overwhelmingly religious terms um by sections of the muslim gentry 
Urdu journals revealed that these themes uh, that were being vigorously debated and contested in the literary sphere found expression in films. So in terms of language, even as it as its expansion uh, to cinema implied that Urdu was free of protracted quarrels over script, the associated politics of religious nationalism was very much present in films. An issue of film review from 1931 carries an article titled Film Sazon Ki Zehniyat or the Mindset or Outlook of Filmmakers by Sayyid Tamkeen Kazmi, which takes offense at and is indignant about Muslims ki tawheen or insult to Muslims in films. What is important here is that the critique is laden with worries about films that glorify Hindu valor and courage, Jawa Mardi and Bahaduri in glowingly masculine terms. The author is disgruntled when Muslims are not edified in the same way and portrayed instead to be decadent and effect. This tells us that the inter-community antagonism and the vicious stereotypes inspired by it that were pervasive in Hindi and Urdu print culture since the 1920s were projected on a much larger scale into cinema by the 1930s. The most objectionable aspect of the representation of religious communities to the said author is the insinuation of inter-religious romance. Musalman ki beti Rajput ke saad bhaag gai, or the Muslim, Muslim woman eloping with the Rajput Hindu man amounts to the community's zalalat or humiliation. This underlines that the discourses of honor and humiliation were very prominent in how cinema was approached among the Muslim literary elite in the mid 20th century, as community contours were more rigidly cemented in exclusionary terms. Um, in terms of social reform, as an influential Muslim middle class was formulating an elite social status since the late 19th century, ideas of sharafat, respectability, uh, adabiyat and tehzeeb or culture and refinement which were cornerstones of this self-fashioning, held great currency in the Urdu literary world. Islam was the guiding principle that was applied to and evoked in many avenues and contexts of social and cultural life of Muslims. In the context of community, Islam indicated molding social behavior, morality, decency, and, and general refined comportment for an ideal member of the Muslim form, who was also to be an upstanding national citizen. An issue of film review from 1932 that we see here carried a page long statement from one Jamal Sabri who was very disapproving of film ki bose bazi that could be loosely translated to kissing and embracing in films, which he argued should be legally banned because it was a khatarna hamla or dangerous attack on the akhlaq or moral character of Hindustani youth. The offended author rhetorically appeals to the sharafat of the nation, which is also feminized as uh, Madre Hind or Mother India. This meant that cinema fell outside the framework of Akhlaq very clearly and was regularly condemned and derided as Zalil and Makru, obscene and vulgar in Urdu literary circles for its bad influence on the delicate sensibilities of the Muslim community. Print was instrumental in shaping, honing and communicating this respectability ideal. Commercial printing or lithography since the early 20th century had given rise to literary journalism and a predominantly male um, new professional class of editor publishers um, that this gave rise to were architects of this discourse. In fact, the thrust for social reform in Urdu publishing had overlapping agendas, as we well know. Many male reformers were publishers and editors of Urdu newspapers and journals for Muslim women and girls, Tehzi Bunniswa, Banat, Ismat, etc. In addition to cinema's already established attack on morality, Urdu print culture during this period of the 1930s and particularly in the 40s faced competition from Hindi publishing as well as the growing popularity and circulation of English publications due to the inroads that increasing English education was making. The editor of Film Review notes the challenges to Urdu print culture in one of his editorials. These challenges deepened the disdain for film among uh, Urdu literary elite. Next slide. Urdu film journals occupy essentially a, a hybrid position um, as the discourse, which is pushed in different directions by contradictory interests, oscillates and fluctuates between the lens of Islam that sees cinema as largely low and a crass form that is ruining sensibilities, and the commercial or business interests that generate uh, film publicity and promote its mass consumption with the aid of print. In film review, we see an effort to play with the notions of high and low culture that are supposed to separate it from film. A recurring tongue-in-cheek satirical column by Mullah Ramuzi titled Gulabi Urdu or Incorrect or Garbled Urdu um, appears in 1931, which appends and subverts the binary by mocking the uh, literary elite's hang-ups about Adab and Sharafat and it teasingly plays up stereotypes of cinema as tamasha or a silly circus for the unrefined masses of gawards or illiterates. Um, the journals also reflect 
a desire to establish films as acceptable entertainment and leisure activity, which stir desire and excitement. For this purpose, films and film journals, as the accompanying paraphernalia, relied heavily on the female body. Um, if you could click one more time, you can see an image. The image on the cover of Filmistan here, depicting a woman dressed in a very revealing lenga choli, sitting atop a film reel and holding a book aloft in one hand. This illustration encapsulates the duality of the discourse in Urdu film journals, both on the relationship between literature and films, and on films and female autonomy and desire. In the image, the woman embodies the attractive um, connecting tissue between literature and cinema, and in the pages of the journal, such presentations of female sensuality and desire often emerge as the subject of tense debate. Urdu film journals during the mid-20th century allow us to see a heightened moral anxiety about cinema with a sharply gendered edge. The shared logic of these movements and discourses that they sprouted was imagining women as sites and terrains of community identity, which many historians working on gender reform and nationalism have pointed out. And they also shared an increasing intolerance towards cultural mixture, a motivation that was deeply gendered in both abstract representational terms and at the material or the corporeal level. Hindustani films were a site for the mixture of language um, where, as gleaned from film plots and narratives and from the social identities of performers on display, religious identities also dissolved. This ability to smudge the rigidities of cultural purity disturbed the basis of ongoing community and reform discourses. Sharafat or respectability, central to uh, elite self-fashioning, focused on producing pious and domestic Muslim women whose practices, habits, spaces, and bodies, sexualities, and desires needed to be scrutinized closely. Preoccupation with Sharafat in the Urdu literary world mediated attitudes to the visual medium of film and towards the Muslim women performers in them. Cinema and its display of performing women who sang and danced and pervoted with men irrespective of religious identity or social status was at odds with the standards of Sharafat and the drive for Islam um, in the education of Muslim women that was meant to instill the absolute opposite, which is tehzeeb, that signaled culture, refinement, chastity, and piety. In film Star magazine, published in um, Calcutta, an issue from 1933 includes a poem by one Muhammad Sadiq Zia titled Film Stage Ki, Malik, film stage ki Malika Se, an ode to the film and stage actress, which kind of encapsulates all the threads that I'm pulling together, where the social transgression of female performance is constantly apparent. The poet's assessment of women performers oscillates between a tone of awe and derision. He describes the Malka or the queen of the stage, alluding to the composite woman performer, through the conventional Ashik Mashuk tropes of the Urdu Ghazal. She is the beloved who is praised for her jalwa and her ada, her mesmerizing beauty, grace, and sensual charms. However, this pain to the woman of the stage devolves very quickly into scorn and accusation, uh, since the poet is fixated on her morality, propriety, or perceived lack thereof. He asks, Kiski agoshe haya bezar se aayi hitu? Whose embrace have you escaped and come? He continues, my arzi, arzi, haqiqi, teri manzil hai kaha, char divar se ya bazar se aayi hai tu. Oh, one from this humble earth, where is your destination? Do you come from the four walls of home or the market? The reference to the four walls of home and the bazaar spells out the private and public binary and establishes the fears of the bazaar as an unruly space of loose, characterless, avara women, probably prostitutes, who mingle with multiple men and sell their bodies for money. It is imperative for Sharif society to know where the actress, singer, dancer, that is the performer comes from, what her antecedents are, because that will determine her propriety. Her place of origin will establish whether she is respectable or not. Her respectability and therefore acceptability in society hinges on this distinction between the ghar and the bahar, the poem's final verses turn belligerent as the poet declares, hai agar ba ismat to beshak husn ka tara hai tu, varna chhod stage niche ya ke avara hai tu. If you are honorable, then without doubt, you are a beautiful star. If not, then come off the stage, you are a vagabond, an immoral. So to summarize these, these examples from assorted Urdu film journals of the 1930s that I've collected so far, so that the show sorry, that the specter of Sharafat pervaded social conceptions of cinema and Muslim women performers in particular. They were judged and marginalized by the intertwined discourses of community formation and social reform. 
these contradictory impulses of the film journals from this era help us to see that the mere presence of Muslim women performers posed a challenge to the ideals of Sharafat. I'll end my presentation with that, but with a short note at the end saying that I'm working on delving more directly into the voices um, and perspectives of Muslim women themselves, uh, which I'm struggling with, but uh, I'm looking through Urdu fiction and, and cinematic narratives and kind of weaving those themes within this, this you know, and connecting them to this archive of work. Um, and I hope to take this further as I continue working on this paper, but you know, meanwhile, I'm eager to hear any thoughts, feedback, suggestions. Thank you. Amal, that was fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. That's, uh, yeah, and, uh, and uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, like uh, excellent use of like the visual sources that you're referring to as well to kind of uh, draw in um, your audience. But no, I'm, I'm sure people have a lot of questions about that. I'm actually already guess getting messages from people who seem to have really enjoyed this. Uh, so thank you. Um, okay. Um, uh, I suppose we can now move on to Professor Jackson, who uh, has been very patiently waiting. Uh, so thank you so much, Amal, and thank and Professor Jackson. Whenever you're ready, we can we can start. Thank you very much. Are you able to hear me well enough? Um, yes. Yes. Please, good. Please uh, let me know during the presentation if you can't hear me. I have some um headphones that i can i can i can put on i'm i'm just going to share my screen uh i want to begin informally while i'm while i'm looking to share my screen by um saying how pleased and grateful i am to be here and how much i've enjoyed the first three pre presentations absolutely fascinating um so let me um okay uh slideshow from the beginning yep right all good we can see your screen and everything so everything good. good you you can hear me well enough and and you can see my screen my yes. presentation isn't terribly long it's just it's just over 20 minutes so we can relax <laughs> and um let me know if you can't hear me um okay so um my the the title of my pre presentation today is a bit of a, a a mouthful, Muslim women in, in India, intersections of class privilege, gender disadvantage, and minority status in the novels of Zina Futahali and Atia Hussain. As elite Muslim women in India, the literary vision of Zina Futahali and Atia Hussain was influenced by their paradoxical position of class privilege, gender disadvantage, and minority status. My paper explores some of the ways in which these intersections of identity are reflected in the author's literary representations of gender and aristocratic culture in India during the era of independence and partition, their approaches to communal politics in India, and their feminist critiques of the gender ideologies which restrict the lives of, of their protagonists. Atia Hossein was born in 1913 in Lucknow. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly. A city which is still associated with its Mughal past. Like the protagonist Leila in her novel Sunlight on a Broken Column, Atia Hossein herself grew up in a wealthy family of, of Talukdars, a class of aristocratic Muslims who owned much of the land in the region and ruled almost as feudal lords under the British, paying taxes to the empire but administering the domains themselves. According to Anuradha Needham, their, their future was rendered uncertain by the movement for national independence. As the anti-colonial nationalist struggle gained strength, the Talukdars had to come to terms with the steady erosion of their powers uh, underwritten by colonial rule in the first place. In addition, Muslim Talukdars had to, ha had to come to terms with what it meant to be Muslim in a previously Muslim ruled but now largely Hindu dominated India. Should they stay on in an independent India with perhaps diminished power and rights? Should they join the Muslim League, support its demands for a separate but distant Muslim state, and after independence, move to Pakistan? 
All of these issues are debated by the characters and dramatized in the narrative of Sunlight on a Broken Column, in which we also see the effects of changing gender ideologies among the elite in India at this time. Traditionally, upper class Hindu and Muslim women had observed purda, seclusion within the home, and the most well-to-do households had separate quarters for men and women. At the same time, the colonial encounter gradually led to uneven changes as many Western ed ed educated Indian men were influenced by European gender ideologies. Beginning in 1835, the British, the British colonial government had enacted a deliberate strategy of providing a Western style education with English as a language of instruction for elite Indian males who were being groomed to assist in the administration of the colony. The top achievers among them were sent to Oxford or Cambridge, where they were inevitably influenced by so-called Western ideas, which spread gradually and unevenly among this elite class throughout India. The effects of these cultural de de developments on the women in their families were uneven too. Partha Chatterjee has written about the ways in which women during the nationalist period were often constructed as, as bearers of so-called traditional Indian culture within the home, while the men in their families were obliged to be more westernized in order to function professionally within the British dominated institutions of colonial India. To some extent, this dichotomy has persisted in post-colonial India, and Indian feminist writers have frequently drawn attention to the greater latitude allowed to Indian males for so-called westernization. However, even before independence in 1947, many upper-class Indian families were ensuring that their daughters, uh, as well as their sons, were educated in English. In most cases, this was not to equip daughters for independence and self-determination, but rather to rend them suitable partners for their Western educated husbands and effective tr transmitters of upper class language, manners and culture to their children. However, there was much debate sometimes even within families about what the nature and extent of women's education should be. In Sunlight on a Broken Column, for instance, Layla receives an academic education at an elite girls' school followed by a local university, while her cousin Zara, the good Muslim girl, is expected to marry early after a domestic education. According to her aunt, she has read the Quran, she knows her religious duties, she can sew and cook, and at the Muslim school she learned a little English, which is what young what young men want now. Zenith Futahali's novel Zora presents a similar vision of a recollected feudal past in late colonial Hyderabad, the largest and wealthiest of, of colonial India's 500 princely states. During the time period spanned by the narrative of Zora, 1919 to 1935, the protagonist Zora's family is part of a Muslim minority urban elite ruling over a multi-ethnic and multi-religious but predominantly agricultural Hindu majority. Unlike Atiyah Hossein's Sunlight on a Broken Column, Dinuth Futahali's Zora does not explore the changes wrought by independence, but both novels chronicle the coming of age of an independent of an independent-minded young woman in an elite Muslim family in late colonial India. Like Layla in Hossein's Sunlight on a Broken Column, the young Zora is confined to Purda except while attending school, where she benefits from an academic education, which is in many ways at odds with the, with the traditional values within her home environment. Inwardly questioning, but outwardly compliant, Zora consents to an early marriage, to an early arranged marriage, which puts an end to her formal education, though she continues to read and to take an active interest in the wider world, particularly the dynamic political situation in, in India during the years leading up to independence. And again, like Layla, the adult Zora is, is still pampered and, and protected in many ways, but no longer confined to Purda. 
In her editor's introduction to the 2004 edition of Zora, Zenith Futahali's daughter, Rumana Futahali Denby, writes that during the colonial era, and I, I quote, the fusion of Hindu and Muslim customs in Hyderabad produced a culture unlike any other in India. And the author's deeply held social and, and political beliefs were founded on the religious tolerance and harmony which prevailed as a result. In Zora, which is set during a time of greater communal harmony, religious differences are shown to be notable, but only mildly divisive. For instance, the young Zora has a Hindu friend named Nalini who cannot stay overnight in the Zanana with the other girls during the days approaching Zora's wedding. Although she is welcome there, she protests that she can't displease her elders. Hyderabad was, of course, not the only site of pre-partition harmony between Hindus and Muslims. We see it also in Atya Hossein's Lucknow, and Anita Desai observes in the introduction to the 1988 edition of Hossein's short story collection, Phoenix Fled and, and Other Stories, that Hossein writes of an undivided India in which Muslims and Hindus celebrated the same festivals and often worshipped at, at the same shrines. This is illustrated in, in Sunlight on a Broken Column, in which Layla's Muslim families celebrate Hindu holidays like Diwali, along with Muslim holidays like Eid. At college, Layla has Muslim, Hindu, and Christian friends who discuss and, and debate politics and religion among themselves, sometimes heatedly. Interestingly, Layla is also witness to sectarian debates within Islam, though she herself never takes a position on any of these issues. Popular stereotypes about Islam as a monolithic religion, which is inherently oppressive to women, are far from accurate, as we all know. On the contrary, there have always been debates within Islam about the role and status of women. We see this, for instance, in Zunuth, in Zunuth Putahali's novel Zora, in which the eponymous heroine hears a heated discussion between her husband and brother-in-law about whether Hinduism or Islam is more uh, oppressive to women. The passage is worth quoting at some length because of its imp implications within the narrative. I don't claim that Hinduism is free from abuses. But who is crusading more strongly against them than Mahatma Gandhi himself? And look at the tremendous effect of it, even among women. Then again, is Islam free from such abuses? Look at the way we have kept our women in the darkness of Purda. Hamid's voice rose as his temper spiraled. Certainly there are abuses in Islam too. I'm all for reform, but you can't deny that Islamic law, the Sharia, accords women more rights than any other religion. The laws of marriage, divorce, win widow re remarriage, and inheritance, they're all in favor of women. With the Hindus, on the contrary, child marriages and the plight of child widows are positively inhuman. Hamid squirmed. He felt like shouting, but how many of these rights you boast of are, are translated into practice, end quote. So several points are noteworthy here. The first and most obvious is the irony of the woman listening silently and deferentially to a conversation between two men about the rights of, of women. No attempt, no attempt is made to draw her into the conversation or even to acknowledge her presence. The second notable point is that this conversation is more about the merits of Hinduism versus I Islam than about women per se. Indeed, there is a long and continuing tradition of political debates in India and else elsewhere, which pretend to be about women's rights when they are in fact conflicts between opposing groups who simply use the woman question as a debating strategy and often as a means of consolidating their own power or otherwise furthering their own self-interested agenda. Finally, it is ironic that the most important point in, in the debate between the two brothers and Zora remains an un, unstated thought. How many of these rights you boast of are translated into practice? Laws and rights are, of course, meaningless unless they are put into practice. 
Although there's been a long and vibrant history of feminist movements in India, studies have consistently pointed to the prevalence of patriarchal ideologies and practices, regardless of communal identity. All over the world, Muslim women's life circumstances tend to closely parallel those of non-Muslims of similar backgrounds. In India, where Muslims are in a minority, recent studies have confirmed that Muslim women's experiences are, are influenced far more by social, cultural, and economic factors than by religious ideologies and practices. And if you want some references, I can supply them in the um, um, Q&A. In both of the novels under consideration, um, a, a powerful motivation for female obedience to patriarchal directives is the idea that family honor depends on it. This is made explicit toward the beginning of Zenith Kutahali's Zora, in which the young protagonist longed to be a part, be a useful part of the events that were stirring her country, thinking that marriage and children should come later. Instead, she agrees to a conventional early marriage arranged by her parents because, I quote, any de deviation from the accepted norm would deeply wound her parents. They might, they might survive the shock, but they would never be able to lift up their heads again for shame and sorrow. She had agreed to this marriage for her mother's sake. She could not in the end destroy her family. In addition, Zora's anxious thoughts re reveal her awareness that the honor of her family depends on the success or failure of her marriage, which she believes to be her sole responsibility. Again, I'm quoting from the novel. My parents have, have done their best to find a suitable husband for me, and whatever manner of man he proves to be, I, I must make this marriage work. Allah forbid that I should bring shame upon Abba John and Ami John and upon myself by returning to their home disapproved by my husband's family. I would rather die than bring shame on my parents. It is they who have arranged this marriage, but I shall be held responsible for its success or failure. Not, not considering her own happiness in the marriage, she perceives herself as an object of potential approval or disapproval, anxiously wondering, what if he does take a dislike to me? In her discussion of Atiyah Hussain's Sunlight on a Broken Column, Arunada Needham observes that words like honor and duty are constantly mobilized by the elders, men and women alike, to, to bind the younger members of the household, particularly women, to various forms of legitimized oppression. Women do resist, as for instance, Abida does when she defends Layla's right to receive an education, or when she insists on Layla and Zara being present while the elders arrange Zara's marriage. But they do so in ways that underscore their lack of real power. Indeed, Layla's aunt Abida is consistent throughout the narrative in her insistence on the importance of duty and obedience. In reply to Uncle Mosin's sarcastic query as to whether she would have Zara choose her own life partner, she admits that this would be unwise, but asks only that the girl be present while we make the choice. Here are arguments, know our reasons, so that later on she will not doubt our capabilities and question our decisions. One interpretation of this is that far from wishing to undermine patriarchal authority, Aunt Abido wants to reinforce it by showing it to be reasonable and not arbitrary. This is also consistent with the way in which Aunt Abida conducts her own life. At the beginning of the novel, she continues to live in her father's house because she is not because he has not found a suitable man for her to marry. There, she has some limited authority, not least in her responsibility for bringing up the or her orphaned niece Layla. After the death of her father Baba Jan, she is married off to an elderly man, Sheikh Ejaz Ali, who is described as a tall, thin, negative man. Overwhelmingly conscious of her duty to her family and, and to the family tradition, she tamely accepts this ar arrangement, e even though it causes great personal unhappiness to her for the rest of her life. 
To her way of thinking, Layla's decision to marry Amir against the wishes of the family is unforgivable. And what she says to Layla sums up the conventional attitude toward female in independence in, in that society at that time. I quote, you have been defiant and disobedient. You have put yourself above your duty to your family. You have let your family's name be bandied about by scandal mongers and gossips. You have soiled its honor on their vulgar tongues. This statement clearly indicates the extent to which family honor and class status depend on, on female behavior. As Leila later laments to her husband, Amir, I have never been allowed to make decisions. They are always made for me. In the end, not only one's actions, but one's mind is crippled. Layla also notices that despite the superficial westernization of Uncle Hamid's wife, Sarah, she is strongly dominated by him. Although she dresses in saris, she has adopted discreet makeup, waved hair, cigarette holder, and high-heeled shoes, so that Jill Didur describes her as the, stereo the stereotypical Muslim mohila, blending Western and Eastern cultural practices in her appearance, but still clearly implicated in patriarchal class-based expectations for her behavior. Brought up in strict Purda before her marriage, Aunt Sarah had been trained by English ladies appointed by her husband, by her husband to fit a, a pattern he had decided for her. The, trans, the, the transformation of Layla's cousin Zara after her marriage is, is even more dramatic, but Layla is astute enough to recognize its superficial nature. I quote, Zara had changed very much in her appearance, speech, and mannerisms. She was now playing the part of the perfect modern wife as she had once played the part of the dutiful Perda girl. Her present sophistication was as suited to her role as her past modesty had been. Just as she had once said her prayers five times a day, she now attended social functions morning, afternoon, and evening. Thus it is su suggested that Zara has merely exchanged one set of patriarchal expectations for an another. Both novels emphasize the ways in which women, particularly older women, internalize patriarchal ideologies and collude in patriarchal practices, often being more active than the men in enforcing traditional gender roles. Indeed, Zora's mother in Zinu Putahali's novel is shown to be skeptical of the value of a female education in contrast to her more liberal husband who wishes his daughters to be well-educated. And, and if in Sunlight on a Broken Column, the older women are zealous in enforcing patriarchal norms and values within the household. It may be because their authority over younger women is usually the only real power they ever have. It will now be evident that regardless of how they feel about patriarchy or about their individual situations, Zenith Futahali's pr protagonist is outwardly more compliant than Atia Hussein's. Aware of her entrapment within a patriarchal structure, Zora in Futahali's novel is nevertheless unfailingly obedient and uncomplaining. The more rebellious Layla in Hossein's Sunlight on a Broken Column marries the man she loves in the face of family disapproval. In contrast to her more conventional cousin Zara, she is portrayed as, as quiet but firmly in, independent. For instance, she is adamant in her rejection of the idea of arranged marriage, declaring to Zara that she won't be paired off like an animal. Her dissenting attitude is understated until an incident when she understands that she is being inspected as a potential bride by friends of her superficially pr progressive aunt, aunt Sarah. Not wishing to be scrutinized for that purpose, she subverts the women's intentions by defending a Muslim girl who, who ran away with a Hindu boy, scandalizing the gathering by speaking about love. The Begum Wat Wahid reads Layla's defense of the wayward Muslim girl as evidence that Layla's own virtue is in danger. The disagreement escalates until, as Layla recalls, quote, 
Inside me, a core of intolerance hardened me against the hollowness of the ideas of progress and benevolence preached by my aunt and her friends. Rebellion began to feed among my thoughts, but found no outlet. Layla's rebellious thoughts culminate in her decision to marry a man of her own choice in, de in, in defiance of her family's wishes, not for the sake of re rebellion alone, but because she genuinely loves a a Amir. However, far from following the popular fiction format of a heroine marrying for love and then living happily ever after, the novel shows that Layla's decision caused great personal suffering, not least because she is devastated to be estranged from her family. All that is revealed about the marriage is that they have a daughter and that Amir dies at a young age. Thus, it is e emphasized that there are complications and uncertainties with all marriages, whether or not they are arranged. I think having been married for 40 years, that's a good place to end my own presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Jackson. That's, um, I mean, I actually have a little bit of a personal story with that. So I was doing my master's in the year 2017, 18. And I remember sort of asking the Cambridge University Library to get this book. And now I have a, a, a copy of your, um, uh, of your book on Muslim women writers and reading through the chapters and, and, and kind of realizing, oh, wow, I, someone has already done this work and I need to change my, change my argument a bit um but uh, happens all the time <laughs> happens all the time <laughs> happens to me all the time <laughs> and, and yeah I, I remember the book was i i asked the library to buy a copy of the book so it, it's it's now there in the english faculty library um but no uh, thank you this was fascinating and i'm sure that i'm, I'm already seeing so many uh uh, so many uh lines of in investigation across these three presentations that um, um, you know, 